What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Mikey McNuggets here. It is about 10 minutes away from tip-off of the Cleveland Cavaliers-Brooklyn Nets game, and I want to hop on here. The Cavs did not make any moves at the NBA trade deadline, and I saw a lot of people freaking out online and figured we'd come here and try to discuss why the Cavs did it, whether or not that was the right decision. Did Kobe Altman make a mistake by not making a move? And if so, what should he have done? And lastly, put your guys' mind at ease over what's to come next for the Cleveland Cavaliers. We'll give everyone a minute or two to hop in here. If you missed the premiere, the debut of the Ultimate 216 Show with Earl the Pearl, it is on our YouTube channel. Make sure you go back and check it out. There is a Ultimate Brown Show tomorrow with G. Bush, 5 o'clock. I don't think he has a guest, but he's taking calls from viewers. The next Ultimate Cavs Show with Jason Lloyd is on Tuesday. Myself and Jason will break down what happened over the weekend and everything else involving your Cleveland Cavaliers as they wrap up the proverbial first half of the NBA's regular season. I know the uh, All-Star break isn't officially the halfway point of the season, but it's close enough. So we'll do all that. We'll talk about it tomorrow on the show as well. But we have Bull and we have Jay and we have G on the set tomorrow. So getting a word in is always tough with those three. So I wanted to get on here, give you guys my thoughts. And if you agree, disagree, that's up to you. But I saw a lot of people, and we'll start with this. I saw a lot of people say the Cavs made a mistake by not going out there and trying to upgrade their depth. They didn't have the assets to get a star by any means, but there were a few players who were traded on the fringe end, back end of their 10-11 man rotation that they could have potentially acquired for a couple second round picks and a salary swap. What For what not, Simone Fontecchio of Utah was a guy that got traded for a couple second round picks. You saw Royce O'Neal go from Brooklyn to Phoenix for a couple second round picks. Cavs decided to stand pat. Kobe Altman said, we like our team. We like the depth of our team. We even have Craig Porter Jr. as an 11th man who's not getting enough minutes for him to develop right now. That's how deep our team is. The Cavs will welcome Tristan Thompson back in a couple weeks from his 25-game suspension, giving them another big man off the bench to help Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. And I count Dean Wade as a big in this instance, but he's a more traditional, physical big with playoff experience. So, The Cavs looked at themselves, they looked at the mirror, and they said, we like what we got. We like our 12 guys. We like the 10 that play right now. And you look at the Washington game last night, Karis LeVert played three minutes in the second half because, and this is what J.B. Bickerstaff said, it wasn't because he was in trade rumors. It's not because it was hurt. It was because he wasn't playing great, and J.B.'s still trying to figure out the right rotations, who plays best with with each other, and how to best maximize the talent on his roster with the 10 guys who are healthy and playing. And last night, His experiment was, Levert, you're going to be the odd man out tonight. He gave Sam Merrill some extra minutes. He felt he needed extra shooting, which Sam Merrill obviously provides in excess. So he went with a different lineup, and it ended up working. They ended up beating the Washington Wizards. So, you know, they have roster flexibility already. There was no need for them to go out there and make a definitive move. And we said on Tuesday, we said on Wednesday, leading up to today's trade deadline, we didn't think the Cavs would make a move unless they were going to get somebody who would definitively 100% be an upgrade to their top eight. You look around the league of all the guys who got traded today, and you got to take out the Bojan Bogdanoviches from Detroit because the Cavs did not have the salaries to match up with that. But the guy like a guy like Royce O'Neal, for example, was he a definitive upgrade over anyone in the Cavs top eight? Is he better than Niang? Is he playing over Isaac Okoro? Is he playing over Dean Wade? I I don't think the answer is a definitive yes. So why give up an asset for a guy who may not be in your playoff rotation? They're playing 10, 11 guys right now. JB has said, he's on the record. This is not me. This is JB Bickerstaff not only telling you face-to-face, but you look at his track record in the playoffs, which leaves a lot to be desired, I know. But he says, I only want to play eight guys in the playoffs. So you look at the Cavs rotation right now, they're playing 10, 11 guys. That's going to shrink in the playoffs. Guys who are getting minutes now are not going to see the court in a playoff situation because rotations across the league shrink. It'll happen with the Knicks. It'll happen with the Celtics. It'll happen with the Sixers, the Bucks. It'll happen with the Cavs, the Nuggets. Every team in the league will do the same thing. You go from playing 10, 11 guys in the regular season to playing 7, 8, maybe 9 in the postseason, and that means guys who are getting regular minutes, well, they get phased out. So I don't think the Cavs were able to look around and see anybody who was acquirable, and that's the key word. You know, if they were able to get a Cam Johnson, a DeAndre Hunter, well, yeah, that's a definitive upgrade, but the Cavs just simply didn't have the assets to acquire them. What did the, what did the, what did the Cavs going to offer Brooklyn 
for Cam Johnson when other teams are willing to offer him two first-round picks, allegedly. Now, the Nets decided not to trade Cam Johnson. The Hawks decided not to trade DeAndre Hunter. So maybe those offers weren't on the table. But I don't think a Dean Wade, two second-round picks, and a little bit of salary filler is enough to get a really high-quality player. So I look at what the Cavs did, and they're betting on themselves. And more importantly, and this is the key part, the Cavs aren't, <coughs> excuse me, the Cavs aren't in the apron of the luxury tax yet, which prohibits them for, from, excuse me, getting a buyout player. Part of being in this whole second apron of luxury tax means a guy in the buyout market. Well, if you're already paying that much money, you, you can't get buyout candidates. The Cavs are under that threshold, which means of all the guys who end up getting bought out of their deals, they're in play for the Cavs now. And I think from the get-go, going back to Tuesday, that was the most realistic option for them to upgrade their roster for a playoff run. And even it's just been cemented today by their lack of moves at the deadline that that's how they feel is their best option to upgrade this roster. Kobe Altman was asked about the 14th and 15th spots on the roster moving forward, and he said, we might convert one of our two-way guys into a full-time contract. We may look at the buyout market. So to me, that signals Craig Porter Jr., and a buyout guy. And I'm, I don't want to go over a list of buyout potential guys yet because there's so much fluctuation. You hear reports of guys getting bought out. They might be, be interested in, in said team or different team. So we'll do plenty of information and, and a deep dive into which buyout candidates make the most sense for the Cavs later. But we mentioned a few on the show today, and, and I'll use this one from Jason Lloyd. But Jason says he thinks the Cavs need another veteran backup point guard just to have in the rotation in case Donovan Darius get in foul trouble to spare them some minutes. And a guy like Kyle Lowry or Patty Mills or Monte Morris are guys who could be available on the buyout market that because of their prorated salaries, you can bring in and Lowry's a little different. He makes a lot of money. You may have to finagle some stuff with Lowry, but a guy like Patty Mills on a prorated buyout contract, he could come in and you stay under the luxury tax. I see Patrick Keith just said Dinwiddie. Spencer Dinwiddie's another guy on the market who I think could potentially be a target for the Cavs. I don't think he's a great fit, uh, I think if they're going to get a backup point guard, it would be someone with a little more traditional point guard play instead of another. Like, Dinwiddie's a good player, but he he's very similar to Karis LeVert in that sense. He's a score-first guy, and they got enough of the enough guys on the roster who, especially in the second unit, need help creating their offense. Guys like Niang, Dean Wade, like those guys aren't craters per se. I would love to see them get a point guard who can help get those guys open. But yeah, Dinwiddie's in that same category. And if the money works because you're buying them on a prorated deal, their other team buys them out, then you bring them in on a severe discount. Like, I'm talking legitimate severe discount. Yeah, th that's the kind of guy that can help the Cavs in a playoff hunt, uh, playoff run here. And they're going to have, I don't want to say like prime pickings, but they're one of the teams who are under the luxury tax who are in a championship mindset. So if a guy, a veteran, is interested in winning a championship, he's ring chasing, which... There's no issue with that, no problem with that. Then why not the Cavs? Because a lot of the other teams in ring chase mode are already in that apron, are already in the luxury tax apron where they can't go after a buyout guy. So when I look at the big picture, for the Cavs to have acquired someone that's a legitimate upgrade, it would have cost too much, in my opinion, to break up what they currently had. And all the fringe level pieces they could have had I just don't think it was an actual upgrade. It was a lateral move at best, and if it's a lateral move, sure, the depth would be nice, but is it really depth if you're giving up Dean Wade to get a Royce O'Neal? He's one for one. Is it better? I don't know. So I have no issue with Kobe Altman standing still. And one thing I do want to point out, the Knicks made a move today. They got Bojan Bogdanovic from Detroit and Alec Burks. They gave up a couple second-round picks. They have a couple players, but they got better today. The Milwaukee Bucks got Pat Beverly. The Boston Celtics yesterday got Xavier Tillman. The 76ers got Buddy Heald. Four of the five top teams in the East, excluding the Cavaliers, all got better. And I saw a lot of people freaking out. Well, why didn't Kobe do something? Everyone else in the Eastern Conference is getting better. Why didn't we make... You can't react to what other teams do. If Kobe Altman, before any other team, made it a decision to upgrade a player on the wing, a big, a guard, make any type of move, Kobe Altman had to look in the, in the mirror and say, I like our team. If I didn't, I would make a move. But I'm comfortable in the 12, 15 guys in this locker room that this team is good enough 
to win whatever whatever their goal is. Championship, I would assume, but I don't want to speak for Kobe Altman. Whatever he believes is the true ceiling of this team. And I don't think you could be reactionary in the trade market. And I think that's a big mistake. And I think G. Bush is going to say tomorrow, well, well, the Knicks made this move for Bogdanovich. We had to do something to counter. I, I don't think you can be reactionary in the trade market for two reasons. One, that's when you get fleeced. When you're being reactionary, you're willing to give up too much for the return you get. And once again, none of these big stars were, were traded today. Bogdanovich, I mean, P.J. Washington, Bogdanovich, like th those are the two biggest stars that got traded. So I don't think you were getting anyone in who was a massive move the needle piece to begin with. But if you gave up two or three pieces for a guy like Royce O'Neal to counter or Dorian Finney, well, let's use Dorian Finney-Smith because he didn't get traded. So he's, he's an actual example. Let's say you pushed all your chips in on the table for Dorian Finney-Smith to counter the Bojan Bogdanovich move by the Knicks. I just don't think it makes you any exponentially better, worse. It's just a neutral lateral move. And if that's the case, if you have no true path to improving your basketball team, within reason, obviously, why do it? Chemistry matters in basketball. Listen, if you don't want to listen to my, my football takes, my baseball takes, you don't think I know basketball, sure, fine, whatever. That I, Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. What I can tell you for sure is that I understand the chemistry in a locker room. Why? Well, I played basketball since I was five. I played in college. Someone asked this, a Viking sat. This is Emerson College where I hooped at. I played baseball, played soccer. I've been in a ton of locker rooms. Chemistry matters. And I think that's a part of sports we overlook a lot of times. And it's, it's unquantifiable by a metric. There's no number that shows chemistry. But it's pretty evident from being around this team, going in the locker room, talking to these guys, even just watching on TV. They all genuinely like each other. And there's not really a bad egg that's souring the atmosphere and the overall vibe of this team. And even when Garland and Mobley got hurt, I think part of the reason they were able to sustain and really up their level of success and, and their quality of basketball was because these guys like each other and they were willing to sacrifice to help one another. And I know that sounds basic and simple and whatever, but like, yes, ob it's obvious, but at the end of the day, not every team's like that. Look at the dysfunction in, in Chicago right now. That team's uber talented, but those guys don't make each other better. Those guys aren't willing to give up a good pass for a great shot. They're all hunting their own stats. Look at Brooklyn, who's playing the Cavs. Tip-off is in one minute. They don't play with the same givingness, unselfishness as a team like the Cavs. The Cavs are assisting on over 50% of their buckets in the last month and a half. And the Celtics made a similar move. The Celtics and Bill Simmons, who I like Bill Simmons. I know he's not everyone's cup of tea, but he is really plugged in with the Celtics. And he said part of the reason that they made the Marcus Smart trade last year was there was just there was a clash of egos. Marcus Smart thought he was the best player on the team. He'd been there the longest. He was the alpha dog when really it's Jason Tatum's team. And there's no clash on this, this, this Cavaliers roster right now. Everyone's falling into place. And you do have to take that into consideration when you're making a look, when you're looking to make a move, especially a lateral move. If you're making a lateral move, is it worth potentially messing up the chemistry in the locker room? Is it? Guys like Isaac Okoro. His teammates love him. Donovan Mitchell loves Isaac Okoro. I'm telling you guys, anytime you ask, anytime you ask Donovan Mitchell about Isaac Okoro, he gets the biggest smile on his face. His eyes brighten. He's campaigning for this man for Defensive Player of the Year, for Sixth Man of the Year, for First Team All Defense. He champions Jared Allen as an all-star. This team likes each other. And at the end of the day, I don't think you can be reactionary to other teams' trades because then you push too many chips on the table, and more often than not, that comes back to bite you in the ass. And I don't think you should overpay for a guy that's a lateral move. So when I think the Cavs and I think Kobe Altman looked at the big picture, the overall grand scheme of the trade market at this year's NBA trade deadline, there was no move that really fit their criteria to improve. They weren't going to go into the luxury tax. They couldn't take on a bigger salary. Their best assets to trade were second round picks, Ty Jerome and Damian James, Damian Jones, excuse me. What are you getting back for that? So no, I don't think it was a mistake for Kobe Altman to not pull the trigger at the deadline. I think it was a smart move, and I'd be shocked. I'm telling you right now, I'd be shocked if the Cavs don't make some sort of acquisition in the buyout market, whether it's a big, a wing, a point guard. I kind of lean towards point guard. I'd be shocked if they don't get someone in the buyout market, and I think that's the smart move. 
I applaud Kobe Altman for being patient, for not feeling the pressure, for not caving to some of the outside noise. It was a smart play. Kudos to you, Kobe. We'll find out who's on the uh, the buyout market. I see Patrick said, what about a guy like Dal uh, Danilo Gallinari? I'm fine. Help is help. And depth is like the Cavs are a deep team. You could always be deeper. You can always be deeper. And injuries happen. To think all 11 of the Cavs guys will be healthy in April when the playoffs starts, probably unrealistic. Just being totally honest, probably unrealistic. Someone's going to get hurt. That's the nature of basketball. Who knows who it'll be, but that's the nature of basketball. It never hurts to have more shooting. Uh, Evan419 says, bring Joe Harris back. Yeah. I mean, I have a personal beef with Joe Harris in the playoffs. Like, he, I think he's almost unplayable in the playoffs. He couldn't even play on Detroit this year, but I take Gallinari over him just for the size. But you're going to bring somebody back in. You're, you're, they're going to get somebody in the buyout market, and that's the missing piece. And the thing with the Cavs, and I'm going to wrap up here in a sec because the game's tipped off. I got to go watch. They were good when everyone's healthy. They've been very good lately, mixing and matching, bringing everyone else back in. They're still incorporating Darius Garland and Evan Mobley into this lineup. When those guys get fully incorporated into this new kind of offensive philosophy, it's not a totally new system. I think that's over-exaggerating, but it's definitely a new philosophy. Mobley will get better. Garland will get better. That makes the team ceiling raise its in its own right because you have two of your four best players finally in the swing of things. And then you get a guy in the buyout market who, I see Evan said, can't be worse than Danny Green, which is right. But Danny Green and Jason Lloyd died on this hill yes, last year, but he thought Danny Green was going to win a playoff game. There's a chance that the guy they bring in on the buyout market cracks the rotation. If he starts playing hot late, you're not going to bring in a scrub. You're going to bring in a guy with some veteran experience, a guy who's played most likely in the playoffs before. And I just think that was the smart, not only financial move, but the smartest team building move. You don't mess with chemistry that way. You don't mess with the rotation per se. The guy in the buyout market is coming in knowing he's got to fight for a spot. Nothing's guaranteed. If you trade for a guy, there's kind of the expectation you got to play him. Hey, I just I just got you this toy, JB. Go use it. And I don't think that's necessarily the case with a buyout guy just based on the circumstances. And also with the buyout guy, you kind of pick and choose your spots with that, with that player. Whether it's, we'll use Gallinari, for example. There, there's a there's a good chance Gallinari doesn't play for two games. Comes in and plays 23 minutes in the third to give Dean Wade and and uh, George Niang a rest and goes off for 19 points, which could happen with a Royce O'Neal as well, but you just don't have to give up the assets. So if you're telling me, and I guess I'll, I'm with this, last thought. If you thought Royce O'Neal was significantly better than Danilo Gallinari, you make the trade. If you think they're on the same plane, what's the point of giving up assets for one when you can sign the other? And the Cavs are in a great position to have the pick of the litter in the buyout market because they are not in the uh, luxury tax apron that prohibits them from signing buyout guys. And there are a number of teams, and bad job out of me. I should have had that tweet pulled up. I was looking at it earlier, but teams like the Clippers, for example, cannot sign buyout guys because they're in that luxury tax threshold. The Celtics, I don't believe, can sign uh, a buyout guy. There, there's like eight or nine teams in the league that can't because of where they are currently in the luxury tax threshold. So the Cavs are about as good of a get or as good of a in as good of a position as possible for a buyout guy that wants to play for a championship this year. And to me, that was the smart move on Tuesday. That was the smart move on Wednesday. It was even smarter move today after I saw the Knicks making moves. I was worried they were going to react. I saw the Knicks got Bogdanovich and I was I was worried the Cavs were going to make some sort of reactionary move that at the end of the day, I just thought wouldn't enhance the team enough to, to counterbalance what they had to give up. So kudos to you, Kobe. I think you made the right move. I think you've made all the right moves in the last six months, going back to the NBA free agency. The unsigned free agent, Craig Porter Jr., Max Struess, George Niang, they've come in, they've done their job. And you gave JB weapons. You gave patience with JB, and it's all paid off. I'm going to read a couple comments here, then I will wrap up. Uh, Sean... Says salute McNuggets. The way I look at this Cavs team now reminds me of the 2014 Golden State Warriors. The way they pass the rock around to the open man, especially from three. They are consistently giving up open shots for even better shots. Uh, Sean says the only difference to me is they have a better center, uh, and the Warriors barely even had a center, which is true. They they went with Festus Azili at center at first. Talking and grubbing media said I felt like there was a significant move out there that I didn't want the Cavs to make a move. So on the same page as me, 
Patrick says, I'm happy they didn't make a trade. Completely agree with the way this team is playing. You can't mess up the chemistry. Plus, there wasn't much they could do. At the end of the day, that, that's really what I feel like. There wasn't, uh, there just wasn't a ton of moves that were out there for them to make. We went over the, the trade candidates on Tuesday, the realistic, the dream scenarios. And uh, Evan, thank you. Warriors, Clippers, Celtics, Suns, Bucks, Nuggets, Heat, all over that second luxury tax threshold. They cannot sign buyout, guys. So you take uh, Golden State, Los Angeles, Boston, Milwaukee, Denver, Miami, and Phoenix out of the equation. That leaves you the war, uh, the Timberwolves, the Thunder, the Cavs, obviously, and what, the Sixers as the best teams that aren't over the luxury. I, I probably forgot one off the top of my head. I'm not looking at the, the standings, but the Cavs are in a very good position to have a pick of the litter for any kind of buyout guy they want. So I think Kobe made the right move, man. I really do. You guys may disagree. I know some people think uh, some people think that they had to do something to react. I, I just think that's the bad. I think at the end of the day, that's just a bad team building principle. You do what you think is best for your team. You let everyone else do what they need to. As long as you think the Cavs are in the best position to win, that's what you have to do. I believe Leroy Horde said, and he probably got this from somewhere else, but Leroy Horde said, at the end of the day, you do what you do best, make the other team adapt. Kobe Altman, in my opinion, did what he thought was best for the Cavs team. Let the other 29 NBA franchises operate on their own realm. While the Cavs are getting worried about the upcoming rest of the season and the playoffs, the other 29 teams are trying to figure out how do we slow down this offense that's shooting 46% from three over the last two months. That's what they have to worry about, not anything else. As far as the Cavs go, no moves at the deadline. I expect them to be a heavy player in the buyout market, and we'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow on the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. I appreciate y'all tuning in. We'll see y'all tomorrow.